Chapter 1, Introduction, Matter, and Measurement. Chemistry is the study of matter and the changes that it undergoes. Why should you study matter and the changes it undergoes? Well, most of you are studying chemistry not merely to satisfy your curiosity or become informed consumers or citizens, but because it's an essential part of your curriculum. Your major in college in the future might be biology, engineering, agriculture, geology, or some form of medicine. Why do so many diverse subjects share an essential tie to chemistry? Well, the answer is that chemistry is, by its very nature, the central science, central to a fundamental understanding of other sciences and technology. For example, our interactions with the material world raise basic questions about the materials and matter around us. What are their compositions or their properties? How do they interact with us in our environment? How, why, and when do they undergo change? These questions are important whether the material is part of high-tech computer chips, an aged pigment used by a Renaissance painter, or the DNA that transmits genetic information to our body. Chemistry is the central science central to the understanding of other sciences and technology. Chemistry uses what's called the scientific method, a systematic approach to solving problems. What is matter? Well, matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. Our study will be of matter and its changes. Well, atoms are the basic building block of matter. Each element is made of the same kind of atom. For example, oxygen is made of, a, oxygen has two oxygen atoms connected together. This is the oxygen that we breathe. A compound is made of two or more different kinds of elements. Notice in water we have oxygen, and then we also have two hydrogens attached to it. And here are several other examples. The black spheres represent carbon, the white one's hydrogen, the red one's oxygen. There are three basic states of matter that we'll study. Solid, liquid, and gas. And I know there's a fourth state called plasma that we encounter, especially on the sun. These are the three primary phases that we'll be studying during chemistry and taking a look at. Notice that gases are the most spread out, liquids take the shape of their container and yet are closer together, and crystals or solids uh, have a regular repeating arrangement. Notice both gases and liquids do fill the shape of their container. Well, how do we classify matter? First of all, we ask the question, is it uniform throughout? If it's not, we call it a heterogeneous material. If it is, we call it a homogeneous or same throughout material. If a homogeneous material has a variable composition, then we call it a homogeneous mixture, also known as a solution. If it does not have a variable composition, then we call it a pure substance. If pure substances can be cannot be separated into simpler substances, then we call it an element. And if it can be separated into simpler things, then we call it a compound. Here are several examples of mixtures and compounds. What are some properties and changes that matter undergoes? First of all, Matter has several physical properties. These can be observed without changing a substance to another substance. Boiling point, density, mass, and volume are all physical properties. Secondly, chemical properties can only be observed when a substance is changed into another substance, like flammability or burnability, its corrosiveness, its reactivity with acid, etc. Chemical properties are available only, and you can see them only when you change, rearrange the atoms that make it up. Physical properties can be observed when you change the state of matter, or you take a look at its mass or its volume. 
Intensive properties are independent of the amount of substance that is present, density, boiling point, color, etc. It doesn't matter how much of them you have, those properties are always the same. Extensive properties depend on the amount of substance that you have, like mass, volume, the amount of energy created, etc. Two different types of changes of matter. Physical changes in matter do not change the composition of a substance, like for instance going from solid to liquid or liquid to gas, a change of state. Temperature is a physical change. Volume of a substance is a physical change. Conversely, chemical changes result in new substances. Combustion, oxidation, decomposition. Chemical changes are also known as chemical reactions. They rearrange the atoms that make up the substances. They result in new things. In the course of a chemical reaction, the reacting substances are converted into new things. And this picture gives us an example of how hydrogen and oxygen gas can be rearranged to form H2O. Compounds can be broken down into more elemental particles. In this example, water in this beaker right here is broken down into oxygen and hydrogen. And if you look real close at this picture, you can see there's twice as much hydrogen as there is oxygen. And notice the formula for water, H2O. The small 2 right here tells you there's two times as many atoms of hydrogen as there are oxygen in that formula, which we can see here there's twice as much hydrogen as there is oxygen. This is known as the electrolysis of water. Separation of mixtures. One way to separate a mixture is through something called distillation. We'll do this in one of our first labs. Separate some homogeneous mixtures on the basis of differences in boiling point. This is one way that we take crude oil and separate it into gasoline, kerosene, and other types of oils that are used uh, uh, in, uh, in the petroleum industry. Here's a distillation apparatus. You can see that there is a heater, there's some water, a condenser that the gaseous products flow through and then are cooled down by the cold water going in, and then the flask down here called the receiving flask, where the substance that's boiled off here is cooled. In this picture, they're separating pure water from salt water. Notice pure water here in the receiving flask because the salt doesn't boil at the same temperature that the water does. Another method of separating mixtures is filtration. It separates solid substances from liquids and solutions. Notice in this picture they have what's called a piece of filter paper that lines this funnel and they're pouring a mixture of a, a, a liquid and a solid together and you get the pure liquid out at the end and the solid stays in the filter paper. The third way to separate substances is something called chromatography. This separates substances on the base of the differences in solubility of a solvent. This is a blotch of black water soluble marker. The water moves up the filter paper and different colors that make up the black marker separate at different speeds. And you can see that black marker is made up of purple, red, green, yellow, and even some blue over here at the top. In chemistry, we measure a lot of things. And so when we want to communicate our measurements to people, we need to make sure to specify the units that we used to measure it. We use the standard international or SI units, also known as the metric system. The basic quantities of mass, length, time, temperature, amount of substance, electric current, and luminous intensity are listed over here and their abbreviation is given next, given next to it. The system uses a different base unit for each quantity, and you should become familiar with each one of these and memorize them. Prefixes 
convert the base units into units that are appropriate for the item being measured. Take for example if we had the base unit meter like we saw in the previous slide right here, M standing for meter. We could put the prefix kilo in front of that to mean it's 10 to the third times as large or 1,000 times as large. Or we could put the prefix nano in front of it, meaning that it is 10 to the negative ninth times the size of a regular base unit called meter. Volume is a derived unit. It's a derived unit that's most commonly uh, measured in something called the liter. Notice a liter is a cubic unit of the decimeter. If you take a decimeter and you have a one decimeter by one decimeter by one decimeter cube, it would be equal to one liter. Notice a one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter cube is also known as a milliliter. A liter is a cubic decimeter and a milliliter is a cubic centimeter. You need to memorize this. Different measuring devices have different uses and different degrees of accuracy, and therefore we need to communicate to others when we measure using different devices how certain or how accurate our device was. Notice a graduated cylinder versus a burette might be able to measure things differently to a different degree of accuracy. Another thing we measure is called temperature. Temperature is the measure of the average kinetic energy of the particles in a sample. In scientific measurements, the Celsius and Kelvin scales are most often used. The Celsius scale is based on the properties of water. Zero degrees is the freezing point of water, and 100 degrees Celsius is the boiling point of water. Kelvin is the metric unit of temperature. It's based on the property of gases, and you'll notice that there are no negative Kelvin temperatures. Zero Kelvin is also known as absolute zero. To convert from Celsius to Kelvin, simply take your Celsius temperature and add 273 to it, and you will have the Kelvin. Notice Kelvin does not use a degree symbol like Celsius does. Fahrenheit scale is not used in scientific measurements, but to convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius or from Celsius to Fahrenheit, you can use one of those two equations. Density is another derived unit. It's a physical property of substance, and density is equal to mass divided by volume. Let's look closer at the uncertainty in measurement now that we know some of the derived units and some of the standard international units that we'll be using to measure. To communicate how good our measuring device is, we use something called significant figures. Significant figures refer to the digits that were measured. When rounding calculated numbers, we pay attention to significant figures so we don't overstate the accuracy of our answers. There are several rules for determining if a figure is significant and therefore should be communicated when we make a measurement. First of all, all non-zero non digits are significant. Second of all, zeros between two significant figures are themselves significant. And thirdly, zeros at the beginning of a number are never significant. And finally, Zeros at the end of the number are significant if a decimal point is written in the number. So if you have a number that has a decimal point, if it has zeros at the end, they're always significant. Notice three of the four rules have something to do with zeros. When addition or subtraction is performed, answers are rounded to the least significant decimal place to the least significant decimal place. When multiplication or division is performed, answers are rounded to the number of digits that correspond to the least number of significant figures in any of the numbers used in the calculation. 
in our next video cast, we'll take a look, or one of the future video casts, I should say, we'll take a look at several examples of significant digit calculations. Accuracy refers to the proximity of a measurement to the true value or quantity. Precision refers to the proximity of several measurements to each other. For example, let's say that we were throwing darts. And if we threw three darts, and all three of these darts hit in the bullseye, and it was our goal to hit the bullseye, we would say that it has good accuracy and is also very precise. All of them hit the same place. All of them hit the bullseye, what we were going for. Secondly, let's say that we threw three darts, and this time our goal was to hit the bullseye, but none of them hit the bullseye. They hit way in the outer part of the, of the uh, dartboard. We would say that they are very precise, but not very accurate. Precise because they all hit very close together. Not accurate because they missed the bullseye. And thirdly, let's say we threw three darts, and none of them came close to the bullseye, and they were all spread far apart. We'd say that that's poor accuracy and also poorly precise. This ends the first video cast on chapter one.